So I'm going to uh, introduce myself. I do recognize some folks that are hopping in here um, from other programs we've done or from previous workshops. So thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Sarah German and I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator with the Doherty Arts Center. Um, and I oversee our Artist Resource Center. Um, if you have never been to the DAC and actually seen, we've got a physical space that is the Artist Resource Center. Um, and then we also do programming uh, like this, Artist Professional Development Workshops. We do these pretty much monthly. COVID's been a little bit different, but um, pretty much monthly and free and um, on different professional development topics for artists. Um, we have another one coming up on December 8th, which is uh, social media for artists. Um, and uh, Ty Nathan Clark will be um, the artist actually uh, giving that workshop. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I don't have that event quite up on Facebook yet, but if you subscribe to our Eventbrite, that it's listed on there. And I'll, I'll put a link to it in the chat for this as well, um, if you're interested in attending that one in a few weeks. Um, we also have some classes that we do. Um, next one coming up is our public artist training program. Um, and that's a six week class um, about uh, applying for and doing public art projects. Um, and our facilitator for that one is actually Jean Graham, um, who is a local public artist and also has worked for Art in Public Places here in Austin, um, as well as some other uh, city entities as well. And so she's, amazing and a, a, a great teacher. Um, and so that one will actually start after the new year, I believe January 4th. Um, but we'll have some more information coming out about that soon. Um, oops, let me, next person. And then um, let's see here. We also, if you know any teens, that are interested in the arts and careers in the arts. We also have a new teen artist professional development program that we are starting. Um, and that'll happen this spring applications. It is an application based program, but it is free if accepted. Um, and so that is called works in progress. And I will, I will put links to all this stuff in the chat here soon. So um, be sure to look out for that. But if you know any teens that might be interested, um, point them our way. And then um, I think that might be it for me for the most part. We have all kinds of other uh, virtual, ex uh, not exhibits, we're talking about exhibits. Um, we all have all kinds of virtual um, events and classes coming up as well. Uh, so be sure to, to follow us on social media if you don't already. Um, and then we do have a, a newsletter that we send out uh, pretty much every two weeks, the first and the 15th or so um, about everything going on at the Doherty. Um, so anyway, like I said, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm glad to see so many people here as they keep kind of, kind of trailing in. Um, we are going to talk about curating virtual exhibits tonight. And so, um, I've got three wonderful gals here, um, with us that are each going to talk about how their organizations have transitioned, um, from physical exhibits to virtual exhibits. Um, but, uh, a lot of it can be uh, translated to individual artists as well. And it might also be helpful for you as an individual artist to hear on the organization side, what they need from you um, and, and ways to make it easier. So um, I have, looks like Annie popped off. Um, we have uh, Katie Saul with um, Sage Studios and Kelly Warden with Art from the Streets, and then Ann Davio um, with the Doherty Art Center in our, our JCB gallery. Um, and so they will each uh, talk a little bit about uh, how they have transitioned. And so they're each gonna take a little bit of time and talk. Um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if they seem really, I, I'm gonna go ahead and facilitate those to everybody so they don't have to keep track of the chat. Um, if they seem really relevant to the certain moment, I might interject and, and ask. Otherwise, we'll kind of wait till the end. And we've got kind of a round of, of questions that I'm gonna, gonna ask as well. So um, we will just kind of see how all this goes and unfolds. And um, again, thank you all for joining. I guess I asked who wanted to go first, but I didn't, we didn't really answer. So um, Annie, how about you go first? <laughs> Let me. Sure, I can. I can do that. 
Hi, how's everybody doing? Um, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to sort of talk about what the Doherty Art Center uh, is doing right now in terms of um, virtual exhibits. Um, we were just talking previously before everybody got on and how we're all kind of winging it and just sort of like, you know, hoping something, hoping something sticks. So um, for those of you who don't know, I'll just speak really briefly about the Doherty Art Center. Uh, it's been around for about 42 years, 42-ish um, years, something like that. Uh, it is located in the downtown area near Butler Park and Palmer Event Center. Um, it houses a school for both uh, adult programs as well as uh, youth programs. It also has um, a performance theater um, and it's uh, home to three uh, galleries. So we do have the main gallery, which is actually the entrance of the Doherty Art Center. And then about a few years ago, I guess it was four or five years ago, the adjacent hallways were actually uh, renovated to incorporate displaying exhibits as well. So we have the main gallery as well as what is known as um, the East and West gallery spaces. Uh, so it's really nice because we are able now to display more people. Um, we have about three exhibits going on at uh, any given time. So um, really uh, quickly about me, I've been in um, uh, galleries and um, uh, art space programs for about 14 years. The last 10 have been at the Doherty Art Center uh, in various capacities. And then the last four have actually been coordinating the gallery program. So um, it's really been fun to see all of the artists that are Austin based come through uh, the gallery space and you know be able to call Doherty Art Center one of their one of their homes. So um, I will say, let's see. Before COVID hit, we operated on uh, a yearly cycle at the gallery. So every January we would uh, begin a new gallery season. Um, and roll out about 20 to 22 exhibits for that year. Um, and again, it was, it was about three at any given time. The main gallery uh, exhibiting artists would exhibit for about five weeks and the East and West artists would exhibit for about seven weeks. And so even though uh, these artists were exhibiting at different times, maybe they started at the same time, maybe they ended at different times, um, I tried to cross promote as much as possible these artists. Um, I really take to heart this idea of the Austin art community. Um, and so because of that, I would, um, host joint receptions as much as possible, uh, joint artist talks as much as possible, um, because it's this, this idea that the interest in one artist, um, utilizing the interest in one artist could really help expose the public to other artists that may, they may not have, have known about. And so I really found that concept successful um, and it's not even to say that the main gallery artist is always that point of interest to draw in exposure for the side galleries. It works both ways. You know, people come in because they're interested in, you know, somebody who's exhibiting in the East space. And because of that, they got to see a new artist in the main gallery and in the, in the West gallery. Um, so when we, when the Doherty Art Center closed down, I sort of, I worried about that cross exposure um, and how that would play a role into um, our virtual presentation uh, presence online. And so what I found myself doing is wanting to do that, that same thing, like have that same process of exposure. So I actually looked into or began creating um, virtual exhibit web pages where artists who were exhibiting um, around the same time ish because they you know they they kind of stagger a bit but i would promote them together on these pages in hopes that you know if 
somebody comes on to look at somebody that they know that then, you know, same thing, they're able to expose themselves to other artists and, you know, hopefully want to, hopefully want to learn more about those um, other artists. And so I actually um, used Spark to do it, Adobe Spark. I have not used Adobe Spark before. I know other, um, uh, other coworkers of mine have used Spark in the past. I have not. I found it to be a really great and easy tool uh, for myself, who is not the greatest when it comes to technology. Um, I seem to, <laughs> I will occasionally have issues like forget to record or like can't figure out how to link my Instagram to Facebook or, you know, there's just kind of all these issues. And I found that Adobe Spark is really nice because I'm able to do things like for any given exhibit, create posts, videos, and web pages all in the same location. So as I said, I started creating these uh, virtual exhibit web pages uh, that pr uh, promoted um, groups of artists that were going to exhibit at the same time. So I'll go ahead and start screen sharing and I will go into our landing page, which is the gallery website. Um, and we'll sort of go from there and we'll jump into one of the Spark pages and I'll talk about why, um, why I put together the Spark page uh, the way I did. So, let's see. Check my time. Okay, so we have got Adobe Spark here and I just wanna show you really quickly, like this is what my dash page looks like. Um, Adobe Spark is free until you want to add your logo to it and then you have to pay. But until then, like you can, create flyers, uh, post images, web pages, you can create uh, video. It's a, I find it to be a really great and easy tool. You're able to just drag and drop things in to Spark in order to use them. Um, and so even here on the JCB Gallery webpage, the thumbnail images that you see were also created in Spark. So you'll see that I have grouped people together, um, spring, which is when we closed. Um, I've got my West 2020 artists. I know West didn't happen this year, but they were exhibiting in May during, um, or should have been exhibiting in May during West. And then I've got summer, photo ATX, um, fall, and then I've got winter exhibits are actually in the works, um, as well as some other projects that we've got going on here. So what's nice is Adobe Spark, you're able to create a web page, it creates a link, and you can just simply add the link to your website and access it from the gallery page pretty easily. Um, and so as as I was creating these individual pages, well, actually let's go into one here, sorry. We'll go into Photo ATX, this is one of my favorites. Um, so this is what it looks like, first, first thing you see, and I'll kind of scroll through. Um, and for all of my virtual, excuse me, virtual exhibit pages, they all look um, roughly the same. They have this sort of general layout. What's really nice about Spark also is that you're able to kind of um, brand or create a brand. So you're able to establish assets as far as color, um, fonts, that um, styles that you want to use in general. I find that a really great tool for organizations to kind of keep things nice and clean across the board. Um, and so as you scroll down, you'll see that I've got three artists here, two were going to exhibit in East and West. And then I have a main, um, a main gallery artist here. And as I began to create these pages, I had to consider a few things. And it was, do I want to show all of the artworks that an artist proposed for the exhibit? Because we're not, not going to show their work. It's just going to be, it's just postponed. And so their in-person exhibits will come at a later date. 
So I thought, no, I don't want to show all of the artworks that they were planning on proposing for the exhibit. I wanted to show enough to create interest so that then they would go and visit artists' websites to learn more about the artists, maybe what other things they had to offer. So with each of these artists, I have a general bio. I've got a couple of images as well as um, links to their website and social media. Um, but then I also wanted to show a little bit more of their artwork rather, just, rather than just a headshot and uh, um, one image. And so I had to consider, okay, how do I want to virtually display their artwork? And that was a little hard because I feel, I feel like the one thing that we've lost uh, with the closure is that immersive experience that is really successful in a gallery. It's that experience that you walk into a gallery space and you, you immediately get that sense of an artist um, and you, you walk into the middle of this room and you have no choice but to be surrounded by the visual language of that person. And that's something that I think is hard to replicate online. Uh, so I started playing around with virtual exhibit videos. You're able again to create videos in Spark. Um, and so I had artists select, I gave them a number, it was usually about uh, 10 images. Um, usually in our exhibits, they have uh, about 20 and upwards uh, artworks in the gallery. I had them select about 10 images um, of works that were really important to them, um, ones that they really wanted to show. And so I used those as well as parts of their exhibit statement that really hit home, that made um, gave great insight, general insight into their concept and added that into these videos um, and then added music. And so my, my thought is, is that with these virtual exhibit videos, you kind of get that similar spark of joy, I guess you could say, like you're, you know, it, you get to sit there, you have this curated experience of artwork presented to you with a little bit of music. And I will say that I even went as far as to like sort through dozens and dozens and dozens of free music and select music that I felt like, felt like the artist. Like I, I, I just, and I would put it in, I would put some music in a video and I was like, oh no, that doesn't sound like Sarah. And I would take it out, you know, or I'd, and I'd try multiple ones until it really felt like them. And then, you know, when it finally, when it finally fit, then we would have our video. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna go ahead and show one of these videos. Um, I know sometimes it can lag when you're trying to show a video through Zoom. If that happens, I'll just post, I'll post the link so that you guys can see it later. Um, but let's go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and choose, uh, let's go with Michelle Gardella's. Here, can you guys all see that? All right.
Sorry about that. My toolbar was uh, covering the X. Um, so yeah, so so that was the virtual exhibit video. Um, and what I ended up doing was doing that for every single artist that is included in these virtual exhibit pages. Um, and what ended up I'll stop screen sharing for just one second and then um, um, go back in. But what ended up happening that I really liked is I started being asked by artists if they could then share the videos or include the videos on their website. So I inadvertently created these assets that artists were able to actually use on their own, in their own uh, on their own websites. And then they were also videos that we could post through social media um, and people without having to click, click a link, select a link were um, automatically, you know, sort of hit with this virtual exhibit experience. experience. Um, so I liked, I liked that aspect, the idea that this, these virtual exhibit pages were actually creating components that then we could use elsewhere. Um, I've got one other ex uh, example of how uh, we actually, um, uh, another, I've got another example of how we sort of added an extra element to the virtual exhibits in place of, you know, not being able to meet an artist in person. We also started doing uh, two minute studio tours. They're called Art Happens Here, two minute studio tours. And I gave artists the opportunity to um, create just really short two minute videos. They could be very informal, super casual. Um, and uh, that just showed us their exhibit space. So it was another way for you know, the, the artist's voice to be heard for the public to meet the artists without actually having to go into the gallery space or without having um, you know, to meet them at a reception. So I'll go ahead and show one of those really quickly as well, because they're fun. Um, and this one, I will say not all artists did a studio tour, but most submitted one. And I just, I left it up to them. I know that some people's spaces are really sacred and they prefer, uh, you know, to keep it that way. but. Um, so I've got, this is another one of our virtual exhibits. This is our summer. In this one, we've got a recorded artist talk and demo. Um, so let me do this. So this is a really fun one. This is John, who is actually, he was an exhibiting artist, but he is also a Doherty Art Center uh, employee. <laughs> Hi there, my name is John Nelson and I am a Doherty Art Center 2020 artist and this is where art happens along with laundry and workouts and storage because this studio is located in the garage of where I live in southwest Austin. I guess we can start off by looking at my shelves I have over here. It's where I store all of my supplies and tools. It's pretty messy but you know I think it's like an organized mess. Then I got uh, the essential workbench right here. This is where all the magic happens. Let's see, you can take it on over here. This is my fancy paper shredder. Hello.
I take my paper shreds over here to my bucket system where I can blend it up, strain it out, and add glue to make paper pulp for my paper mache sculptures. This is a work in progress. And then I use this wall for my hanging pieces to store them and also work on them. And that's about it. This is where I like to uh, get messy. I hope you got a spot where you can do the same. Thanks for watching. <laughs>
Wow, I was taking notes too. I hope everybody else was. <laughs> um, I'm still I'm still working uh, as trying to make sure that ours is the best it can be. And I love some of those ideas. I'm going to go do some research on that. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I'm um, Kelly Warden. I am executive director for Art from the Streets. We're an organization that work with the homeless and at risk in downtown Austin. We usually have um, an open studio that um, people that are experiencing homelessness or at risk can come and paint and create. And then we help them sell their artwork in the community as well as offer enrichment opportunities um, throughout the community also. And um, as you know, um, everything went to a, a, a stop in March. <laughs> um, we do have a little more difficulty reaching out to the artists right now um, because some of them are on the streets. Um, some of them are in housing. So we are um, happy that we're able to continue with them and they're all staying healthy and um, COVID free, yay. Um, but we have about 35 to 40 that we really are able to like connect with on a regular basis. There's about 20 that we haven't been able to since March. Um, we do work with Caritas and um, Integral Care as well as Trinity Center and the Arts to try to um, be sure we're making um, contacts and um, so anyway, that's a little heartbreaking for us as an organization, but we're doing with the best and um, that we can and, and we try to get our, get our name and get our contacts out so we can reach out to the, the homeless. So since then, we usually have shows throughout in the community. We rely on the community opportunities to create art shows, the studio tour, East and West, as well as um, connections with other businesses where we're able to have shows. And then we usually have an annual show, which is in December and it's three, two days and it's thousands of pieces of work and everybody gets to be there and chat with artists and chat with the people. And of course that's not happening again either. So um, trying to figure out how we can help the artists and connect with them as well as give them a way to, to sell their work because we did have a print gallery but the original art is really what people are looking for and um, what we really loved because it gives us that one-on-one -on -one communication. And if you're an artist yourself, you understand people want that story to tell. I want, to, I want a piece of artwork in my house. I want to talk to you as an artist. I want to know why and what was your inspiration. And that's what these shows have done for us in the past. And you've really been able to kind of, you know, change your ideas potentially about um, people who are homeless too. So anyway, we've... Um, been very devastated. And I've met with our artists this last uh, month because we're getting ready for a show for the online show. And I think that was the word that was throughout everybody is, is a devastation feel of not being able to be in the community. And I'm sure if you're an artist or work with artists, you you can understand that, that word also. I think we all connect with people and um, want to talk about what we do and want to talk about our inspirations and it's hard and many are, are, are devastated. So this um, fall, we ended up um, pushing into a art kit program for those that we could reach out to. And we ended up reaching out to over 350 persons in the community, 50 of them of our artists, and then another 300 of those um, in the FIT program, the Veterans Program, Integral Care Program. And we created art kits so that people could create and paint in their homes or in their spaces or in an outdoor space. These bags were or waterproof, they have, um, we did a selection of um, supplies at one time and in September, and then we did another one in October. And um, which I think there was a question of what you're gonna continue on doing. I think virtually, yes, we're gonna continue on with shows. And then yes, we're gonna continue on with the, the program that's been created during this time. So um, we have gotten and received back. We put a mailer, we put sent them a kit and then we put a mailer back in. So when they're done, they can mail it back to us. So we're trying to do, you know, no touchy of any sort <laughs> and um, works out well. We have had some artists that are just not able to create right now. It just, it doesn't, it's not happening for them. And then we have some that are blowing it up. So it just, and then, then everybody's devastated. That's just a common thread, I think. So um, as an organization ourselves, um, we had, you know, an online presence, absolutely. But we really felt our number one was, was the public and people and stuff. And um, we've had to figure out how to make that connection. I think as we all are in a virtual world without um, actually no touchy. So, <laughs> so anyway, we, um, we start, we had no shows all year. We started with one show and um, in August and we just didn't know how it was going to be received. We started actually with a, um, 
it's a it's a fundraising platform and it's called better unite and um, we started there and we put you know about 75 to i'm sorry about 200 pieces on and we had a huge a huge following and a huge sale it was two days worth we had videos in there and it was all on this one platform and i'm happy i I think I pulled it up here. I'm going to share it real quick. I, I don't necessarily, we have worked with Better Unite. They are also our CRM platform. So when people are just talking about analytics and, and being able to track that, being able to merge the sales of artwork as well as donations and purchasing on a platform that does that, but doesn't necessarily show art perfectly. It's, we're trying to like make two things go together that don't necessarily do, but are working okay. I, I can't say beautifully, but okay. <laughs> so um, I think people walked in, saw the artwork, was very excited about it. And um, then we were able to actually be able to put them into our platform and into our CRM and, and be able to follow who they are and what they're doing. So I'm going to have never shared, go figure, but I'm going to do it now. <laughs> Hold on just a second. <laughs> Okay, I hope. Can you see my screen? I hope. No, no. Okay, wait. All right. I want to do it. Ooh. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so this is the, the Better Unite site. It is a free platform. It is um, cost you nothing. They have a little something at the end where they ask your donors to like help pay for that as an organization. We actually do that ourselves. So anyway, this is it. I, it's a little clunky. We have been very happy and been working with them to um, kind of change up some of their wording like auctions and events and um, things like that. But we go in and you, I'll just hit the edit here and um, you kind of, um, you type in all your information here. You add an item number, you add your pricing. Of course, this has, you add a category, which we really found to be, because we're gonna have so many pieces this year. Um, if you like abstract, if you like figurative, if you like pop artwork, um, because we'll have 750 pieces this December, it's kind of nice to be able to, to streamline it into a space. So um, that's what that is. You have, um, you put, put the piece of art in there. Oh, my desk didn't show it there. And that's what you do. So we've started, you get a sneak peek. This is for the new year for our December show. So this is artwork that we upload, you know, about 25 to 30 every night. Yay me. So <laughs> that's, that's the one that we did. And I'm going to show you what it looks like in the reels. So you'll have all your information. It could be any sale again. And um, you'll be able to click on a link and you'll be able to purchase the piece um, straight off. So it's not a bidding or, I mean, obviously you could do a piece like that if you wanted to. Um, like any platform, you have to set up your bank accounts. You have to set up it, but on the whole, uh, everything is free. And it has all of the, um, the analytics in the back end. And let's see if I can just find some of that um, here. And so this is what your page, this is what your page will look like as you open it up. So here it is, here's some information. You can write and give any, you know, we talk about shipping. Um, I think one, one problem that us as an organization have found is fulfillment of 758 original pieces. There's no way out there to do that for you. There's not, I, I've looked, I've called, they're not interested, maybe one or two, and you're gonna have to do that yourself. If you find someone, my goodness, please tell me. But um, I went through about three or four different organizations and they said we need to go to an art shipping company. And um, I can't afford that. And I can't add that. It just doesn't benefit anybody there. So anyway, this is the piece. This is what it looks like. This is how it, it shows up. You have a little place for donations, your website and so on. And I'm sure there's video options and so on with that piece. So the other piece, this is for the big one. And this will hold, we're gonna put 750 pieces in this. So this is a biggie. And it's again, a little clunky. And I'm still going to say that even though we're still working with them, we found Better Unite being very um, open to make some adjustments and changes for us too, for what we're trying to do also. Um, <clears throat> the other piece 
that we're doing for the um, studio that we just op we just started is um, a platform called Kunst, Kunst Matrix, and and it's K U N S T M A T R I X, and it does this beautiful stuff. <laughs> so it is smaller. Um, you pay for as many and uh, many pieces and as many times you want to have the show. Um, we just did the smallest just to see how it works. Because again, we're just, we're just trying to figure this out exactly. So um, this is on our website. You can um, plug it in. Our website is the Shopify website. We did have to invest in a higher um, level on, on Shopify. There's different levels for different advantages to that platform. And we have had our expenses for this have to be um, upgraded. So it's, it's a beautiful little gallery. Um, you feel like you can make it different colors. You can have wood floors. Um, you also can do enter it and walk around yourself or you can do a guided tour and it will sit and tell you where everything is and what it's doing. Um, no music though, bummer. I want, I want, I, 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 I have not sold it. That doesn't, I may have to pay more, but next time I want some of that music. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I think that would feel good. You could sit and have a glass of wine and enjoy a little music and walk through your gallery in one evening, right? So, um, so anyway, it, you can, you name them, you have information here about them. You, um, here it is, tells you what the size it is. You have to input that. Of course, we're very lucky that um, Hugh Miles is with us and we're able to add his piece. So that would be an artist, artist face profile something so people can see who you are, which I think is, is key right now. I mean, we're all tr desperately trying to touch and people in the safest way possible and be a part of it. And I think um, being an artist, um, it's, it's, it's key. So um, that's, it's, um, this has been really neat. Um, I think we plan as an organization to have this from now on. I think when we're able to meet and greet, we will want to do that, but I think this will continue. I have no doubt in my mind. It's just so worth it. And also it spreads um, our artist and our program and our mission a, a broader scale of people. Um, normally our big show is just Austin. And I, you know, I've had people wanting me to ship some things and I just, there's no way I can make that happen. Again, fulfillment. That's like somebody needs to make that business and go into that because <laughs> it, it's advantageous. <laughs> so anyway, that is kind of our, um, our, our piece and what we've kind of set up this year. And um, we're still learning. And um, I'm going to just say we're, we'll start learning and we'll continue to, to, to grow and evolve as I know everybody else is trying to do also and um, make this um, the best we can do for the artists in our program, as I know that that's what everybody else is trying to do and trying to make sure that we find a way and find the best way to connect with um, the public and people until we can meet again. And, and um, I look forward to that, but again, I think this is, this is for us as organization, it is, it's here to stay. Great, um, I think one, Quick question is, um, I think they were, it was during the, the Better Unite when you oh, were right. looking uh -huh. through that. Um, yeah. Can individual artists use that or is it just for nonprofits? No, oh, no, anybody can use it. Yeah. All right. And it's Great. really, again, it's really not set up for artists in general. It's more of a fundraising platform, but um, we're trying to make it all work because the back end is so amazing as far as I'm um, collecting data. I mean, it tells you where they come from Twitter, where they come from all your social media. It tells you where they, and then it collects if they give the information, they don't have to give the information they purchase the work, but if they do, then um, that collects all of that and puts that all together. So, you know, as an organization, I'm trying to find, you know, one-stop shopping as easy as possible for all of us. I, you know, I, we have one um, employee and, um, we have to like make this work as easy as we can for those that are volunteering their time with us. So that is why, um, that's why we're making that work. Sure, great. All right. Um, I guess next we have Katie with Sage Studios. Let me get you spotlighted here. There we go. All right. Hi everybody, I am Katie Stahl. 
and I am the uh, co-founder and executive director of Sage Studio. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Can everybody see that? Great. Okay. So uh, Sage Studio, we are a studio and gallery space in East Austin. Um, and we work with and represent artists with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, so we provide the materials, the space, and the support uh, for our artists to produce, exhibit, and sell their work. Um, a little bit of background on us. Uh, my partner, Lucy, who I think is here tonight. So hi, Lucy. Uh, we started SAGE in 2017. And uh, when we first started out, we were working with just one artist and we were working at Lucy's uh, kitchen table. And then in 2018, we found a shipping container uh, for rent on Craigslist. It had been uh, refurbished and an air conditioner had been added, which is key, obviously. And so uh, we moved in and we launched our, uh, our studio program and our exhibition program. Um, and so our studio program, we have artists who at least prior to um, prior to March were coming into our space and making their art uh, with us. And then we also have a number of what we call our gallery artists who um, make their art elsewhere. They might live outside of Austin. Uh, some of them work in mediums that we can accommodate in our small space. Um, and so we have a, a regular roster of about 12 or 13 artists whose work we show. Um, and then in May of this year, we had the opportunity to move into a slightly larger space. Uh, so we went from a refurbished shipping container to a refurbished trailer. Um, and our new space is a part of the Canopy community uh, still in East Austin. Um, so we are, are very much looking forward to, to being able to use our new space um, when, you know, when we are able to do so safely. Uh, our, so our exhibition program, um, the way that we have set it up, at least prior to this year, uh, we were doing quarterly in-house exhibitions and then we participated in East as well. Um, and our exhibitions uh, were generally group shows. Um, they were uh, themed. And then we've done a couple of solo shows here and there. Um, the picture on the top left is an artist by the name of Charlie French. He is a uh, Dallas-based abstract artist. And that was a live painting that he was doing at one of our shows. Um, so all of our shows, we would have a big opening reception with drinks and music and all the artists would come and it felt like a big party. Um, and then that would lead into the show. Uh, and we really had no virtual component uh, to speak of. Um, at the end of the show, if there was work that hadn't sold, we would sometimes add it to our online store. Um, but beyond that, uh, we really weren't doing anything uh, virtually. So, um, you know, like, like lots of other arts organizations and, and individual artists, um, when the pandemic hit, we had to really pivot in terms of how we were thinking about and how we were executing um, our shows. Um, so our first uh, virtual exhibition was a, a show by the name of Homemakers and it opened in September. Um, and the show featured uh, 16 artists with intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, from all over the world. Um, and like our, our shows, our in-person shows, it was themed. So the theme of this show, you know, there are organizations like ours that are all over the country and around the world. And when everyone had to shut down in March, all of these artists that had been working out in the community um, had to shift their practices home. So uh, about half the pieces in the show uh, were pieces that artists had made at home during the pandemic. And then the other half uh, were home themed pieces. 
Uh, so a couple of the pieces here, the two on the top, uh, one is by a San Francisco artist by the name of uh, Lian Wen. The, the piece on the top right is by a Madrid-based artist named Mar Rodriguez. And then the bottom pieces are uh, an artist in Morocco, Adam Lacani, and then a Brooklyn-based artist named uh, Larry Willoughby Jr. Um, so, you know, we really had no idea what to expect in terms of how successful the show was going to be. Um, we really didn't have anything to, um, to base it off of. And we were, um, we were very pleasantly surprised, uh, you know, by the, you know, the number of people that viewed the show and then also by the, um, by the sales. Um, so the sales for this show, it was about four times more than any in-person show that we had done. Um, so, you know, it was a big success for us just in terms of, of sales. And I think, you know, one reason for that is historically, we had only really been able to show the work of Texas-based artists. And through um, this show, we were able to open it up to artists from around the world. Um, so we weren't, you know, limited in terms of geography. Um, and then we also weren't constrained at all in terms of uh, space. So our physical space is, you know, is quite small. And so when we have in-person shows, we can only show so much work. And so we were able to, um, to just have more pieces um, than we had been able to do in the past. Um, so I think those worked in our favor. Um, so that show closed at the end of October. And we are now on our uh, second virtual exhibition. Um, this one is a solo show that is part of the Austin Studio Tour. Uh, so it opened uh, this past weekend. And um, the artist, Sam Eiler, he is 19. And he has been making uh, puppets since he was 10. And so he has amassed this really amazing collection of handmade puppets and costumes. And we wanted, um, we wanted to showcase that. And uh, we wanted to do it in a, a fun and interactive way. Uh, so whereas Homemakers was a pretty static show in terms of um, there wasn't really any interactive element to it. People could go and, and look at the work and, you know, read about the artist and, and see photographs of the artist. Um, but there weren't any interactive elements. And so this time around, uh, we wanted to find a way to incorporate some interactive components. And so I'm going to play a little video. Hopefully this will work. The sun is in the sky and clouds are rolling by it. Today's going to be one wonderful day. Hand in hand together, we'll be friends forever. Sharing all the good times, happy and free. It's going to be so easy going. We'll laugh our cares away on this easy going, easy going day. So um, what we did for the show is we took short videos of Sam. Um, he not only makes the puppets, but he also voices um, a lot of them. And so we took videos of him doing songs and little uh, snippets of dialogue and we, we took those. And so if you go to the website, uh, you can you know, click on the puppet and then hear and see it and, and really get a sense of, of what Sam does. Um, and then beyond that, we wanted to, um, to introduce another sort of fun component. And so we're doing a raffle uh, where you go and if you enter the raffle, you have a chance to win a completely custom puppet uh, made by Sam. So the picture uh, here is Sam with a puppet that he made of himself. And so the winner of that is going to get a, a puppet made in their likeness. So that has been, um, that's been fun. Let's see. 
Um, and then I wanted to touch on one more show that is upcoming. And uh, this one is a show that was scheduled to open in April. And obviously that did not happen. Um, this one is a collaborative group show that's gonna feature uh, pairings of work by 16 uh, Texas artists with and without disabilities. Um, so each of our artists was paired with a local artist um, based on shared interests or themes, um, materials. And uh, the idea was that the work was going to be um, exhibited in tandem um, and you know, in sort of egalitarian way that was reflective you know, of the fact that these artists are, you know, deserving of having their work shown um, alongside their neurotypical peers. Um, so, you know, we had done all of the, the lead up to that show and we felt like um, it was really important that there be an in-person element to the show. Um, just because of the nature of the show and the partnerships and some of the, the artists had had the opportunity to meet um, and some of them hadn't and the show was gonna be a chance for them to do that. Um, so we, we really struggled with what to do with this show and we didn't want to do something that was, um, that was totally virtual. So about a month ago, we were approached by um, someone from the Carpenter Hotel and they offered us the use of their outdoor event space. And so what we are hoping to do is in February, we will have an in-person small ticketed preview event for the show. Um, and then we will simultaneously, um, we'll install the show in our gallery and, and open it up for in-person visits by appointment. And then um, at the same time, we'll have a, a virtual component to it. Um, so that's our plan. Uh, whether or not it comes to fruition, I don't know, but we're hopeful. Um, so those are the, the three shows that we have done and, and that we hope to do. Uh, in terms of, of sort of the nitty gritty, we have kept it pretty simple. Um, all of the shows have been, you know, housed on our website um, using the tools uh, that are available. Uh, we use Wix for our website, so it's not fancy, but you know, neither Lucy nor I have a background in web design or any of those things. And so it's worked for our purposes. Um, I know we'll talk about uh, analytics and all that, and there are capabilities there. Um, and then the other big thing that we've done, uh, which we've had success with, is we've really tried to um, push the shows on our social media and particularly on Instagram. Um, and so for homemakers, you know, that show ran for six weeks and every day or every other day we would feature a new piece from the show on our Instagram um, and then, you know, highlight the artists. And we found that that seemed to drive, you know, people to the show and to drive sales. And so we've, we've been doing that with Sam's show as well um, and, and try to sort of integrate the platforms in that way. Um, and then just in terms of sort of the takeaways, um, we have found, I think overall that the constraints are a lot lower and the stakes seem to be a little bit lower in some ways um, for virtual programming. Um, so, you know, I mentioned our physical space is quite small, but that's not an issue when we're doing virtual uh, programming. Um, and then geography, you know, being able to represent artists outside of Austin has been um, really nice for us. And then just financial constraints as well. Um, you know, the costs have been significantly lower. Um, and so we've been looking at these exhibitions as a chance to um, to kind of go bigger in a lot of ways, um, and then to try some new things and try to think outside the box. Um, and then the other thing that we've found um, has been, I think collaboration has been really key for us. Um, in that Homemaker show, you know, we collaborated with uh, seven or eight 
other studios that are across, you know, across the country. And then in one case, uh, there was a studio in Spain. Um, and by partnering with those organizations, uh, and if you're an individual artist, then I, you know, I think the same principle applies, partnering with other artists. Um, and by doing that, you know, your audience grows exponentially because their audience is now your audience. Um, and again, you know, geography isn't a limiting factor uh, when it comes to who you can partner with. Um, and so I think that's something that we will continue to keep in mind. And so, you know, as we hopefully move toward having in-person events again, as Kelly said, I think we will um, we'll continue to, to use some of the things that we've learned and, and try to, you know, incorporate these these virtual elements because they have been um, they've been successful for us. And if you if you do want to check out our uh, our current show Sam Eiler's Puppet Party, that is our website. Um, and then you know there's our all of our info. All right, thank you, Katie. Let me bring all four of us back. Uh, okay. um, so I do have kind of a list of questions I threw at these guys beforehand, um, and we've touched a little bit on some of them, but just to kind of get some conversation going as well. Um, and Katie just did kind of hit on this one, but I'll, I'll see what, what if anybody has anything to add. Um, so yeah, how do you how do you see this affecting your future exhibits when we can go back to in person? Um, will you continue to provide virtual content, and to what extent? And what kind of like do you think you'll be able to do both and have kind of the manpower to to do both, so to speak? Yeah, well, I I just want to say yes and yes because I just feel like it's not going to happen. I mean, whatever. The vaccine, whatever it is that's going on, is it not going to be an immediate thing? It's, it's not. It's not going to be that. And then there's still going to be people that are going to be very uncomfortable being out that are po po potentially compromised on many levels. And so I just think I'm investing our time and energy um, in making that happen, as well as I have a, a daughter getting married in the spring, and we're doing that virtual video. So I mean, I just feel like even if we have events. We're going to always have something, somebody in the room that is going to be taping it. And I think you're right, at getting it out to everyone. Um, and just our audience is so much broader now. And I think people are paying attention now versus, you know, having that, oh my gosh, I need to be here, I need to be there. No, I want to watch this and I want to pay attention to this here. And I, I think it's, I think people are really making that happen and making that important. And, you know, I know my family's sitting down and we're either watching you know, the next Netflix or we're watching the next show or we're doing, you know, the Zach Scott or we're doing, you know, something. And, and we've, and I'm not a techie either, but I'm figuring it all out and making it happen. And I, I think it's, I think even when we're able to be together, we're going to be doing this too. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, we'll continue with um, the virtual also, I think for the next year, it'll be a little bit easier than it would be if we were to continue it in 2022 because the Doherty Art Center, all of our artists that we're promoting through these virtual exhibits will be um, exhibiting hopefully, you know, in person in 2021. So at that point, I will be able to, to update those exhibit pages, you know, with more current information, update it with demos or artist talks I think going forward beyond that, I do want to continue, and I think we should continue the virtual aspect of it. I think um, with my hours and like a party, a person of one, it'll be hard to do both when I'm trying to roll out 20 plus exhibits plus doing the virtual stuff. But I think, I think finding a way to incorporate the virtual will be, I mean, I think that's going to be a forever thing now. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of touched on this uh, as well. Um, 
and, but this also includes statistics, um, has your audience expanded um, with going virtual and how do you track who is viewing your exhibits? I mean, I can answer that one. I mean, I think I mentioned, you know, we track it through our website, but just in terms of sales, I mean, we've been shipping work all over the country and in a couple cases, um, we've shipped work internationally this year. Um, and, and because we were able to collaborate with organizations from all around the world, that opened up our audience in a big way. Um, so like Kelly, we're trying to figure out all the logistics of that. Um, but yes, absolutely. We have seen our audience grow as a result of, of doing the, the virtual programming. Yeah, and I think um, with us, I mean, our outside, outside of Texas sales, as far as online prints was maybe 1%. If, if that, and now we're a good, you know, five to 10 now of people outside of Texas. And all we have ever really done as an organization is really promote in Texas. And, and, and our strategic goal as an organization has always been to expand, but you know, who has the time sometimes, right? Now we have the time. <laughs> we have to, have to make it happen now, right? So I think if there's anything that has come out of this, there's been some positive things, at least for our organization, there's really like made us step up and go, okay, we're not doing this. So now we get to do this and we're making that happen. And that's exciting for us. I'll say we um, at the Dorney Art Center have been using Google Analytics and it doesn't sound like it provides as much information as you know some of the things um, you guys are using, but it does, like you're saying, like we're able to see that people out of state are visiting these virtual exhibits, which is, which is really fun. I mean, and even though, you know, we host local artists still, it's really neat to think that these local artists are now being viewed by somebody in Alaska. So, and it, it's fun seeing it pop up on the map in Google Analytics as to who saw what from where. So it's fun. All right. Um... How have your expenses changed with moving to a virtual platform and what are some of the new costs associated with it? Well, I'll go first this time. Sorry, Ann, you wanna go? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so our costs have gone down as an organization. R renting out spaces to have events in Austin pre-COVID. I don't know whether any of y'all have those numbers in your mind, but I know them and it's expensive. It is expensive to have a space, it's expensive. And yes, I'm a nonprofit and they donate, but it's still not 100% for us. And um, having events, even our fundraiser, we have a spring fundraiser, it's small, and um, it, ha it happens in April. So right after everything happened, we shut it all down. Our expenses were a third <laughs> of what they are normally. So in reality, it all evened out because we had gotten sponsors ahead of time. So the fundraising, because we're not having to be in a space. Now, then there's also the other side of that I'm not getting able to talk to people and I'm not, we're not being able to have that community that we love so much as an organization. So that's just, I, I'm not saying that's gone. I'm just saying it's put on hold for a little while. Um, we are having to invest, like I mentioned, in social media. And in a team and actually invest in a team that actually knows more about how to do this than, than I do. And, um, but I, I, again, I think it's an investment that's crucial to all of our futures. I don't think it's just going to be for right now and then go away. I think it's today. And I think we as an organization and us as a, as a little nonprofit have been kind of ooched into it. And I think it's crucial that we were because I'm not really sure I would have invested so much time in all of this and energy as well as in, a little bit of expenses if I hadn't, you hadn't just been kind of, you know, head around my neck and let's go, <laughs> right? So I have, and, and I don't, I find I, as, an, as a small, again, a nonprofit, I haven't found it to be that much more. It's just a lot different, that's all. Now I'll say, I mean, our program, we haven't because a good portion of my budget, my very small budget was spent on reception food and printing for vinyl, vinyl titles for each exhibit. So, you know, we're not, we're not doing that 
Um, I mean, the way our budget functions a little bit different is because we are a part of the city of Austin, you know, and so it, it'll always get captured by, by something else or used or put towards something else. But what I'm, I'm excited about doing now is being able to use some of that money and um, paying artists for virtual demos. And so that's something that we're going to be able to add in, you know, as you know, we're still working from home and not being able to meet in person is, is that I'll actually get to pay artists for virtual demos. So. Um, I'll just echo uh, what Kelly and Ann said, our expenses have gone down as well. Um, and one thing that we have done is you know, we haven't really been doing framing um, and we've been trying to keep shipping expenses lower. And so we've been shipping, you know, more paper pieces. Uh, so that's been part of it. And then um, for homemakers, we actually did something different. We didn't even physically get the art. Um, so we had uh, the artist ship the pieces directly to the buyers at the expense of the buyers. Um, if the piece is sold and we just kind of cut out the middleman and we felt like that was like a safer way to do it and more cost effective and just easier overall. And so that's been, um, it was easier for us. We didn't have to, you know, we didn't have to manage the shipping and then it's been less expensive as well. All right. Um, we've touched on this a little bit too, but there's a little bit more. Um, do you think your viewer do you think your virtual exhibits have been successful in comparison to in-person exhibits um, for both your organizations and the artists that are involved? Um, and how are you kind of like determining that successfulness? I can start this one. I, I feel like it's been successful because we've been able to figure out how to keep artists in the spotlight. We on our end don't handle sales. And I like to think that like, we're still able to drive traffic their way so that, you know, there's still interest in those artists and, and their work. Um, I feel like we're generating a buzz for what's gonna happen next when people are able to experience the work in person. I've gotten so many comments on social media um, and from other artists that, People, people make comments and they say that they're just, they're excited to see this in person. They're excited when they can actually go and see the texture of an artwork. And so I think in, in those terms, it's successful because it's really, it's sort of like propelling us forward for when, you know, when people can see it in, in person. Uh, I would say um, yes, I would say from a revenue standpoint and from, uh, you know, in terms of audience reach, I think it has been very successful. Um, but, you know, we have, we've missed the in-person component. We've missed the, the kind of energy of, um, of a gallery opening. And that's something that's really important for our artists, particularly, um, because we really try to emphasize, you know, that our artists are working artists and you know an opening is, is a big component of that and so that's a that's like a really kind of crucial piece that's missing um but then also in terms of like an accessibility component people who might not have been able to make it to the show um have been able to to view the show and so in that way i think um it's been successful also We're going to be also very good at this when it's over. It's going to be easy to add it to what we do next. <laughs> so, I mean, I, all of us. <laughs> but um, yes, I, I found it um, successful. Um, of course, I am working with artists that are at risk and homeless. So obviously, we're gauging by sales as part of it because it is a, um, a modest income that they do receive by by their artwork and stuff but um it also um any type of sale and any type of success like that is also so part of um lifting all of us and lifting the artists themselves up is in their person and i think during this time where isolation is happening where we are all trying to figure it out and then um i think having 
being in a show to set, selling a piece of artwork in a show gives that self accomplishment. Um, and I think it does it all the time. And unfortunately it's not in the community that we all want right now, but it is still there. And I think gets everyone through a period of time and what's going on right now and, and maybe some hope of what's in the future. Like I mentioned, our artists are very devastated being not a part of this community because that is a big component of our organization is the community that we have every week and stuff. But also that when we do have these shows and they're upcoming, we have actually um, pinpointed volunteers to reach out to our artists um, every week. So they have three or four artists that they just plug in. Hey, how you doing? How's it going? And I'm just making sure everybody's doing okay emotionally and just letting them know what we're thinking of them. And I think because the show's up and coming, it gave them that inspiration to like, okay, I remember what this has been in the past. I remember what I'm gonna do. I remember, I really like doing this. I'm gonna do this now. And um, I have some supplies and I'm gonna create that. And maybe stepping away from what the negativity and the isolation and, and the depression and the mental health that goes on right now with people that are at home a lot and all the time and actually deal with that on a regular basis. Um, so having success is, multifaceted, <laughs> it's, it's income generated, absolutely. But um, it also has to do with that self-esteem and self-reliance that they're working on. And um, I think having that gets everybody, at least our, our little group gets some jazzed about um, creating work and, and, and making a difference for themselves. All right. Um, we can kind of, that's a lot of the questions I had for these guys. Um, if if y'all have any questions, any of you attendees, um, feel free to put it in the in the chat and we'll, we'll answer those. I'm also, before anybody starts hopping off here, I'm gonna put a link to a survey there in the chat for y'all too. Um, as, as Annie kind of mentioned, we are part of the city of Austin and so, um, with the limited funding we get, we appreciate when these guys hop on and, and uh, do workshops with us, um, but continuing to get funding for some of our programs, the, the city likes statistics. So um, we love survey feedback um, on what you guys have thought of, of the workshop um, and, and what you'd like to see in the future as well. Like I mentioned, we've got social media coming up next month um, or here in a few weeks. Uh, but uh, we'll start again in the spring after the holidays. And uh, I would love ideas for, for topics of what people want. I tried, I had to kind of re-gear our fall workshops because uh, some of them were, were really based on in-person things. We were planning one, Annie was gonna actually do a, a how to hang, prep your, your artwork for hanging, which is not necessarily um, needed at the moment. And then uh, we had another one on uh, casting auditions. So <laughs> we decided to, to refocus on some virtual content for the fall. Um, and so here we are. And it sounds like we'll probably continue to kind of go that route um, as we go into spring. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. I guess one other one that I kind of thought of as we were going through this, um, what would you like artists to know um, that would help you all with putting um, virtual exhibits together as far as, um, I don't know how to photograph artwork or what, what are some things you guys have run into that it would have been helpful if artists knew um, off the bat? Um, yeah, I would say photographing artwork. And I mean, we don't have a fancy, set up. Um, we take most of our photos on, on our iPhones, um, but just the importance of like lighting, just take your, your work outside and, and photograph it there. Um, that, that would be the number one thing because we're having to rely, especially on a show like Homemakers, where the artists are all over the world, we were having to rely on, on them to, to photograph the work and it mm -hmm. makes a big difference. I will say, I always like to address with artists their, their artist statement, because that, that's one thing that I have um, a hard time with, not a hard time, but you know, it's, they will submit a statement to be used that I'll use in like these virtual exhibit pages and artists have a lot to say and it can go on for a really long time. And so sometimes I have to like really sift through and be like, okay, what are they actually trying to say here. So I always suggest 
you know, when you take a look at your artist statements, throw out anything that's not needed. I mean, keep it to exactly what it is that you want to say just enough to get your concept across across and then you know let every let the public's imagination sort of do the rest so can as concise as it needs to be yeah i'm gonna just say a little grace <laughs> for us all <laughs> trying to get through this together <laughs> um i we do we do have a photographer that um, donates his time with us as well as for our show so we're very blessed with that but you know set we had to this year photo i mean usually we just photograph a small collection to go on prints but with everything going online we had to photograph 750 pieces of artwork and um over the course of i didn't know it was going to take so long many days so <laughs> Um, it is a process and I feel for all the photographers out there and photographing any pieces of artwork, it does take time and energy. And in fact, my intern, Amy, is right there. She knows she was the big helper in our show this year. So, um, and then, you know, documenting, labeling, I mean, it's just an enormous project to, um, to take on. So just a little grace for the, for all of us trying to make it happen. Yeah, and I, I think fortunately people are still, yeah, aware that we're all all new to a lot of this, and and yeah, especially figuring out how much time some of it takes, where you think it's gonna go real quickly, and then it it doesn't. Um, one question in here was, uh, do you see a future where there are exclusively online art galleries or artist collectives? Uh, since space is so precious and rare, this may be a great way for people to break through on their own terms. Thoughts? I think, I think we'll always at the Art Center focus heavily on in-person. It's just, and you know, it's like, what I stated before, how we're kind of missing that immediate immersive experience. Um, so I think it can happen. And I think it's a great tool for individual artists, these virtual exhibits. But I mean, I still think that we'll, we'll focus a lot on in-person still. I think we're going to go hybrid. I mean, for sure. I think it's going to be a little of both for us. I just feel like the reach is so, um, beneficial to our program itself, as well as the artist. Um, so I just, I, I want to have shows. I want to be in person. We all do. Even though our artists are kind of cranky about it, they absolutely are missing it like crazy right now. Um, and, um, but I think we're for sure going to have it both. We're going to have the hybrid selection for sure. Sorry, yeah, I, I would just echo what Kelly said. I think hybrid. All right. Um, yeah, I think I think as, as organizations, yeah, we'll probably certainly still do in-person things, but um, when we're safely able to do so, but this will definitely, like you say, it'll trickle in and we're gonna, it, I don't think there's any going back. There will probably always be some sort of virtual content. Um, but but yes, I, I think it is a good time and a good opportunity, especially for individual artists to break into this world, um, this virtual world where they've maybe not um, had a, a studio that they can open during East or, um, or even have people come to, but they can they can put their work out there in these virtual galleries or um, or create these spark pages, you know that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, I think this definitely is a good time for individual artists as well um, to utilize this these tools and and going forward and and see where it goes. Um, maybe it'll end up saving people a bunch of money on studios that they don't need. Um, all right, I think uh, I don't really see any more questions at the moment and we are about at time. Um, so I wanna thank you guys again. There's all kinds of thank yous in the comments if you wanna, you wanna look through those. Um, you can visit our website um, and spe specifically the Artist Resource Center website, which is austintexas.gov slash artist resource center. 
Um, and it, it's exactly like it sounds, Artist Resource Center, all of the Doherty's classes, workshops, um, uh, events that we do for artists to help you guys out. So um, thank you guys. Thank you, Katie and Kelly and Anne. Um, it was a great discussion. Sorry, I couldn't get Facebook Live to work. Um, yay, technology. Um, but uh, thanks Grace. again. Everybody have a wonderful night and a wonderful week and safe holidays. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Bye.